No mai hoki mai ki a the fold e mihi ne ko Duncan Grieve tokungoa. My guest today is Bill Curden, who has a voice you will almost certainly recognise. He's narrated a whole bunch of uh, New Zealand's kind of most iconic sort of factual reality observational documentary shows uh, like Neighbours at War, Renters, uh, Motorway Patrol. You just There's just a whole list of shows that he's worked on um, where you might have heard his voice, but he's worked as a field director or a, um, a post director in all kinds of kind of crucial roles in, in cutting together the footage, assembling the story out of, out of your hours of, of footage that, that made a whole strand of New Zealand's uh, shows in that vein uh, come together. I personally have a, a theory, I suppose, that these, these are some of our most underappreciated uh, works of television. They're the kind of shows that particularly like a, a critical canon would might not even review, or if it did, it would review it very disdainfully. But to me, that, that window into the sort of ornery, kind of <laughs> feisty, a bit weird New Zealand character that came through in, in Neighbours at War in particular, but actually in all of those shows, that that is who we are as a people. And sometimes television can just give you an idealised or a sanitised version of that. So I think to have these kind of mass, super popular shows that uh, presented us with with less of a polish, uh, that, that it feels really valuable to me. So I'm having Bill on today. The, the hook is that... Uh, Last Friday was the 30th anniversary of Greenstone Television. Bill has spent over half his career working um, with that company and you know he describes it pretty well near the end, this, this kind of quietly very successful company that has just delivers over and over um, these, these beautifully made shows about these slightly strange characters that perform really, really well for networks. It does a lot more than that, but I just wanted to get Bill on to drill into that particular vein. So this is a huge part of his career, is, is, has been spent in television, grappling in, in one way or another with, with who we are as a people, not necessarily when we're at our best, but, but certainly a, a facet of, of us as New Zealanders. But why I wanted to have him on the show for a long period of time is that he he's worked in parts of five decades and, and has a 40-year career that spans radio and television. And prior to his move into television, he spent a long time as, as a, a crucial figure at, at BFM during the real glory days of that organization. If you've listened to this podcast a lot, well, I'm sorry. But um, but also you'll have heard frequent reference to the kind of glory days of BFM because I think it was a really important media organisation and a lot of the talent who went through there, you know, likes of Jeremy Wells, uh, Paul Cassidy, and so on, uh, still have kind of really crucial roles to play in some of our biggest productions to this day. I think it taught you things about making television that was both professional kind of did what it needed to but also had just enough that was slightly odd that um that it that it elevated from where it you know from a more humdrum product so we, we spent a significant chunk of time talking about that and actually about his pre-history um pre-bfm history uh making radio in belfast and final day and the thing about bill i think based on this conversation is that you know, he comes from a commercial background but has always worked with these um, strange, often difficult characters. He's kind of the, the straight guy who can hold the thing together so that it can be delivered but but also doesn't want to chase away the, the sort of slightly anarchic spirit of what makes our television really good. And the reason that I keep going back on this, on this show is that I think we are missing some of that at the moment uh, in our current media environment for reasons which are entirely understandable but still don't make it right that our product lacks for it. Uh, and I recognize that it's, it's harder to, to do nowadays for, for a myriad of reasons. But that's why I love doing these conversations uh, periodically with someone who's, who's been around and seen 
a few things from different angles. And, and yeah, I've really, really enjoyed this conversation with Bill Kidd and on the occasion of Greenstone's 30th birthday on the fold. Bill Kidd and welcome to the fold. Greetings, Duncan Grieve. Uh, I'm so, so excited about this. I wanted to do it for a long time. Um, and, and in part because you've got this career that spans five different decades, multiple eras and, and kind of passages to it. And I feel like there's just so much to dig into there. So I'm just going just gonna to roll right into it. I, I love the fact that you, you sort of started when it almost like a germ seed of the commercial media in New Zealand with, with the deregulating uh, radio industry. You know, up until then, the vast majority of our media was on some level government owned and controlled. Tell, tell me about those first jobs and uh, the sort of atmosphere for people who were building this thing out from, from almost nothing. Well, it was tremendously exciting for me to start in FM radio in 1984 when I left school. A message had come around art history where I was studying with Willie Davis, the actor, and Greg Mayer, who went on to become a famous TVNZ producer. And they were looking for a trainee copywriter. So I went down, took the interview, got the job. And that was sort of where everything started. But but prior to that, all you had was the local government-owned station, which so is where called Radio North. Point? This is Whangarei. Yeah, right. So Radio Northland was the local government-owned station, and that's all we had. It was mono. And what 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 what, what are you hearing? Like, how, how much? You're you're a school kid. You're you're into music. How much of you is in that product? How do you mean? Like, how much? How 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 much did it feel created for people like yourself? The, the new station or the, the FM? The original. Yeah, because, well, up until that point, the music that you heard on the radio was all mono, and here was this new thing that was stereo and was going to play more sort of modern music. It wouldn't go as far as Joy Division, <laughs> but, you know, it was playing, you know, the, the sort of the newest stuff that we were all into. And to be led into that world was just such a revelation for a, for a country boy. You know, our our record collection at home, Mum and Dad had ABBA Arrival, which I wasn't that into, and they had Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass and some compilation records and not really anything else. So in those days, you know, if you wanted to know anything about the international local music scene, it was just radio with pictures. I couldn't afford to buy the NME or the Melody Maker or even Rip It Up, really, even though, you know, that stuff was around. So... I just walked straight into this whole colourful world where there was a big room, as big as this one we're in now, full of records that I could play whenever I wanted, with all these grown-ups who were smoking pot. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And, mm. and so, so you started as a copywriter, and you, you know, you stayed in radio more or less for probably fifteen, yeah, or so years after that, maybe even a little longer. What, what? What was it about the medium that, that sort of got you and, and how did you kind of move from that initial kind of foot in the door uh, deeper into it? Into radio? Yeah. I just, I think I travelled through different radio stations because I've always been quite easily bored. Once I'm somewhere and I'm doing something that's going really well, generally I start getting itchy feet and I want to know what's next. That's why television suits me, I think, so well because our contracts tend to be four or five months tops, and then we move on to something else, and I love that. Like, I could never work on a show that's necessarily the same show year in, year out, although I kind of have, yeah, as well. So you, you, you got the start in, in New Zealand and kind of this kind of crash course in a, in a just-born industry. Then you moved to, to Northern Ireland, this much more sophisticated market, much closer yeah. to the beating hearts of culture, but also the troubles is, is going on at the same time. Yeah. The, just, just tell me about how you got there and, and, and what you found when you did. Classic young man's plan. I was t must have been 22 and I thought, I know, I've done a few years in radio. I've got a bit of, you know, some skills. I've been a DJ, I've been a copywriter. I've done okay in this fully deregulated, saturated market. I'll go to the UK where it's not deregulated, where there's 60 million people, and I'll get a job over there. And it was it was impossible. I wrote to every single radio station in the British Isles and got 
flat rejections. I should have kept them all. There were so many. But I got <laughs> one back from Northern Ireland where they were setting up a brand new FM station and they were looking for a more sort of a cosmopolitan kind of feel. So we had a Scottish guy. We had a whole bunch of different people there. And they, for some unknown reason, felt that an Antipodean accent might work quite well on the station. So they said, come over, we'll pay for your flight. I flew over and um, there was some toing and froing. And they said, well, you know, we'll get you to start a few weeks before the station goes to air. And that's what I did. And the, the on-air aspect of it, because typically you've worked behind the scenes, is that, is that fair, fair to say? I mean, obviously you've done a lot of narration, it's a very familiar voice, but... Uh, you know, what what did moving to that 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 side of things kind of teach you? Going from copywriting to being a DJ. Yeah. Um, I don't know, but it was I wanted to be a DJ. Being a copywriter was great, but I wanted to be a DJ because you know I'd heard all these. I remember when I was when I was probably fifteen or sixteen, the two FM stations in Auckland opened up, which was ninety one FM and eighty nine FM, which became Triple M, and they were both FM stereo radio stations playing pop and kind of rock and our farm at the north of the Kuiper I could actually pick them up on my little stereo so I was listening all the time to these great DJs you know playing this great music and this this amazing world down in Auckland I hadn't even been to and I wanted to do that I wanted to be what those guys were right so when I got the chance at the f first radio station I worked at in Whangarei to be a DJ and do my first graveyard shift, I jumped at it, you know, and I and I stayed doing it for quite a few years. In terms of the, you know, in Northern Ireland at the time, that that was a, a place of, you know, real unrest. Did that ever sort of seep into the the, the sort of the day job? Yes, um, it was still quite dangerous then. When I when I told mum and dad that that's where I was going, they they were like, well, that's that then. You know, you might as well be going to Iraq <laughs> or somewhere like that, you know. and, and laugh. It was, it was legitimately like... <laughs> it, was, it was still quite dangerous. And um, I'll tell you a story about that. When I first got there, I, I didn't know anybody. I didn't know really anything. And John Ryan, my friend from London, came over to visit for the weekend. I'd been there about two weeks. And I had a car. And so I said to John, let's go up the Falls Road, man. And the Shankill Road, let's go up and have a look because we've seen it on TV our whole lives in the news. Let's go check that out. So we jumped in my car and we drove up the Shankill, drove down the falls, you know, to see the the military vehicles and the guys with this the This is effectively and, the, the, the sort of border, the quite militarised border between yeah, Northern yeah. Ireland. There's, there's one, one they're, they're both very, they were quite sort of seriously dangerous areas. One was Catholic, one was Protestant. I can't, couldn't even tell you which one, which was which. But we drove up and down there and, and John was hanging out the window taking photographs of all these, you know, all the stuff, all the paintings on the walls and the, and the, and the, the light armoured vehicles and the soldiers and stuff. <laughs> and on the Monday I went to work and my boss, John Paul, said, how was your weekend? You know, how are you getting on? How are you fitting in? I said, great, man. We, we went up the Shankle and the Falls and took some photos and here they are. And he just went white as a sheet and said, okay, at lunchtime we're going to go to the pub and I'm going to tell you about this place and what you do and don't do. Because if you do that, if you drive up and down those roads as a young man in a car taking photos, someone's going to think that you're taking photos for a particular reason. Yeah. And you'll get shot. Just in case. Absolutely. Like yeah. he said to me, if, if the wrong person saw you doing that, you would have been followed, pulled over, and you would have had a bullet put through your kneecap for, just, just to be sure. You know, yeah. so that was a crash course. <laughs> That's terrifying. <laughs> but but apart from that, you know, you didn't really see if you knew where to go and where not to go. It was I just loved it there, and I still I still have fantastic memories, very fond memories of Belfast. Great people. So so after that, you moved to what you know in my mind is is one of the kind of the, the pivotal roles in your career, but equally. A really important era for a really important organisation in this country's media history, which was BFM in the sort of in the 90s, effectively, and you had a couple of different roles there. Started out making commercials, which were, they were so much a part of the station's identity and its posture, 
its brand that 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 you had the DJs and you had the music, obviously, but that but they felt such a huge differentiator for it. Uh, where did the, was that sort of pre-existing, or did you sort of start to build that? No, it was pre-existing. It was pre-existing, and basically, when I started there in the early nineties, it was um, it was the same place, but I felt like it was not. Uh, I felt like it was sort of unpolished in a good way. And I felt that it could be more than what it was. So with my commercial background, I became production manager and the commercials probably became just just more and more dynamic. I don't know. Um, But I always thought from the commercial background is if you have six, like we did six or seven minutes an hour of, of commercial, you know, that is a, that's your inventory. You can't just give that away to Adrian and John from, Magnus Benro, in my mind, it's icons. Let's, Even though they're icons, you know, I, I've, because of a, I have a copy background, I would always consider that six, seven minutes, whatever it is, in a commercial hour, to be s- extremely important, because you don't want people switching off. It's got to be this symbiotic thing. So, yeah, we we went out of our way to make those commercials as entertaining as possible to to sort of support what else was going on on air. But it wasn't. I didn't do it. It was Bob Kerrigan mostly. Are, are there any sort of that, that stand out? Whether they're sort of incidents that that flowed out of it, or, or creative that felt like it sort of summed up the, the ethos of that particular moment? Shall I tell you the Karen Walker story? Let's let's hear the Karen Walker story. <laughs> Poor old Karen. Honestly, what she had to put up with. She um, she'd advertised on the station because you know it was fitting. And her empire was just beginning, and and she was a really really good supporter of the station. But there'd been some something happened where Mikey called her and continued to call her a horse on air. This is one of our key advertisers, and there was this appalling situation where one of the sales team, and I think it was Josh Hetherington, had to go down and meet with Karen and explain to her that he'd had a meeting with Mike and the station management, and that he couldn't guarantee, he would try not to, but he couldn't guarantee that he wouldn't continue to refer to her as a horse, which, you know, which caused all sorts of problems, and that was sort of typical of how we behaved at that time, just appallingly. And even myself, one I remember one time we'd done one of our infamous breakfast buses where we'd get a double-decker bus and all pile on and broadcast around town from it. Um, and I'd forgotten that Karen and her partner, Mikhail, had um, arranged to do a commercial with me at nine, and I turned up at ten, steaming drunk, and went into the studio, and there they were, and she was, she was not happy, which is fair enough. And, um, you know, I asked her if she'd like a drink, and I spilled some, and it was just, it was just awful, just so unprofessional. But... Also, at the same time, we knew what we were doing as far as cre- being creatives. Do you think there was a way, because that, that, the station in that era and a bit beyond had a reputation as being a sort of, it was, it was very alternative, very creative, but also quite boisey and not necessarily a great place to, to be a woman. And that sort of Karen story speaks to that a little. Yeah. Do you think there was, you know, when you look back on it, do you sort of feel like there was a way of having that, that creative license there Without having that that atmosphere, that that ambience, that was you know like the good of it without the, the some of the negatives of it. We I guess didn't what think I'm about it like that. We right. just didn't think about it at all. I don't think. I mean, we were all certainly. I I um, admit it was a boys' club for sure, but there were girls in the boys' club. You know, Noel McCarthy was one of the boys. Wendy Adams was one of the boys. But you had to be one of the boys you as a to, woman. Yeah. yeah. So I guess I guess probably what I'm saying is that just because you were a woman, you weren't going to be treated any differently. You know. I but but certainly looking back on it, it definitely was a boys' club and it would have been exclusionary, most definitely. The the other thing that sort of sticks out in terms of your your roles, you know, it was that time as program director during the time when it it assembled this kind of outrageous roster of, of talent that flowed through various shows, much of which are still kind of around uh, New Zealand's media today. 
how how heavily involved were you with that? And and because you know, as you just alluded to, there was the you kind of need to be tight but loose with with, mm. with the talent to get that the get all that out of it. Mm. Uh, yeah, like what what was what was that? Becoming program director, it sort of coincided with the station flourishing. I'm not I'm not saying I had anything to do with it necessarily. It was just a lot of really interesting great people in the same place at the same time into all the same stuff. But I did see an opportunity when I took over from Graham Hill to really um, embed and start playing all those all those great 90s bands that you can think of, you know, the Soundgardens and the Pumpkins and all that stuff, and just push out the accepted boundaries, um, I guess. There was always a bit of a tension with B, right? Like, you know, how indie should it be, yeah. you know, and, and yeah. by expanding that boundary a little and kind of formalizing it a bit while not chasing the, the sort of fringy mm. stuff away, you can, the, the business can just be that much more consequential while still retaining its true character. I, I had the advantage of coming from inside, so I'd already been there for a couple of years, so people knew me. And I and I started, yeah, put, you know, like pushing out further, but but wanting to keep that line. I just wanted to sell our product to more people, basically. I wanted more people to be into it because I was so into it and we were all so into it. So that's really all that happened. But it was playing that music, just pushing that out, the, gr the grunge, I guess, taking advantage of that because no one else was. Mm. Uh, th the first thing I did was throw Mikey on breakfast and it just went from there. It just got bigger and bigger and um, became more and more fun and I think we probably got more and more arrogant maybe and out of control and agree I don't know but, but there was a there was a sort of a market for and a license to have that which because you you had you know in parallel you know you're, you're sort of 10 years or so into a, a more deregulated more licentious kind of atmosphere and then an alternative culture was needed in some ways to sit alongside that yeah. right yeah uh, in terms of you know Mikey does feel like the emblematic talent of that era, and we'll talk about him on, on television a bit more shortly. What was it about him and, and his approach? Because that felt like the, if you are trying to figure out when the peak of BFM's influence was, it was that that period. What was it about him and the way that he went about things that, that had that, that kind of crossed over a bit, I suppose? Well, he was so bombastic. I mean, you just, you can't not like Michael, you know. I'd first met him actually years before that, I was working, I'd come home from Northern Ireland for a summer because I just had done with the weather. And I flew home for a few months. And I was working at a radio station in Tauranga called Coastline FM. And Push Push were big right then. And I remember they were coming to the station and he came bounding up the stairs. He was just this ball of energy. And that's who he is. He's he's a, he's a really unusual guy. He's There's just... You'll never, you'll never, there'll never be another mic, you know. And I guess you, there was certainly some pushback from some quarters at BFM that he was going to be put on the breakfast show, which was the big show. But I didn't give a shit. I just knew that he meant, you know, people would tune in. You know, I mean, if you think about your classic student radio DJ, that's not it. No. Well, and, and even the fact that Push Push is not a BFM band by no. any means. No. But he'd had a number one single. Yeah. On both sides of the Tasman. Absolutely. That's not nothing. It's not nothing. It's, <laughs> it's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. So, there, uh, you know, along with the, the, the host, there were these sort of generations of artists, and you, you, know, you just referred to some of them, which became crucial, like local and internationally. You know, when we were talking earlier, you talked about, because BFM got them first. That's the whole point of BFM. Mm. Some of that sense of brushing up against talent which, and, and that, and, being very aware that this thing is a rocket and you're watching it take off, essentially. Do you, do you want to just talk about maybe any specific artists or, or kind of, you know, whether it's receiving a, a record or a tape or something where you're just like, hold, you're, you're very conscious that you're holding this thing that's just about to explode? Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah there's a, so many examples of that. It was just almost like a daily, a da a daily thing um, at a certain point. I remember, I remember Paul Masters from Virgin Records coming in one time and he had this new single from the Smashing Pumpkins called Set the Raider Jerry that no one had in the world. And he gave it to me and said, there you go. That's not out for two weeks. Stuff like that. Chemical Brothers, you know, we had a Chemical Brothers remix that no one had heard at all apart from them. And there was this one time 
we got a cass- an audio cassette and it was Dave Grohl's Foo Fighters demo album. Well, I think it was the finished album, but he'd made like a dozen of them and sent them around the world to places where he thought it might be appropriate. And we got one. And um, we, you know, found the singles on the album and started playing them like hell because we knew that eventually they'd, they would they would hit the market. And I threw it away. <laughs> <laughs> Just such an embarrassment of riches. What would that be worth it, now? It really was. It really was. I used to, and, and, of course, being the program director, I was always getting these cool things from record companies, little special pressings and this and that. And I don't even know where any of them are. I've got one. I've got one. It's an REM uh, box set that's probably a little bit valuable, but I just I gave it all gave it all away to the to the guys. When you look at BFM now, and it's in the situation where it's having to sell a bunch of, mm. yeah, you know, what remains of that, you know, how, how do how do you and I suppose you must be in touch with other former, um, you know, people from that era. Do, how does how does it kind of make you feel? And do you think there <laughs> there is another path? For the organisation? I don't know because I don't have anything to do with it anymore. And, of course, we, you know, me and the old other old-timers, we do talk sometimes about it and what's happening. But by and large, I don't have anything to do with it. And because I think it's really important that you recognise your time there is your time and then you move on and it's someone else's time. And, and they'll do what they have to do to stay afloat, I guess. I hope they do. Yeah, it's um, it's very hard to just retain that connection to culture when when the the sort of means of distribution has changed so so radically. Mm. That just to return to Havoc and Newsboy, yeah, that that was also you know, that that duo uh, became your entry into to television as a as a medium, and there's something kind of shocking, less so in hindsight, but but certainly at the time, the idea that you would have something that you know, bombastic, I think is a good word, that would land on TVNZ, uh, you know, this, which was, you know, kind of the the establishment in a lot of ways. Is there a particular kind of episode or, or moment in the in the filming of it that stands out as kind of really crystallising that, that juxtaposition and how, how strange it was? Mike, well, first of all, you know how Mike ended up on, ended up there. Neil Roberts was a friend of his, Neil Roberts was head of television and that's how Mike ended up there. At, the, at one point, Mike was tossing up between Jer- Jeremy Wells and another guy, Jason Hall, who he used to call the rock pig, as being his co-host. He ended up choosing Jerry and the pair of them started off. And then they, they, the show went for a, a while, I don't know, it was two or three years, and then Mike and Jeremy and... and um, Paul Cassidy and Jill, the producer, all had this falling out, I think, and everything just collapsed in a spectacular fashion, and then that's when I came on board. So I had no real experience at all in television production, at all, but I did know Mike and Jerry pretty well from the radio days, and radio was pretty much, I was done. So, so that's that's how that all started. Are, are you wanting me to tell you a story about? I, I guess about the show because I feel like, on some level, like perhaps because of the participants, it it feels almost not forgotten, but certainly not as present in the memory as shows like Eating Media Lunch or, or yeah. Moon TV even. Uh, uh, and yet, uh, the sort of permission system that allowed those to exist, a lot of it started with Havoc. Yeah, well, there was nothing like Havoc on t- on TVNZ prior to that. That's that's I, I would say nothing that um, anarchic yeah. and undefined and um, just haphazardly put together. We would literally have an idea in the morning and and shoot it in the afternoon and cut it and often will pretty much always go beyond when we were supposed to deliver. You talked you know, when we were speaking before about. Uh a trip to Ibiza that sort of seemed to sum up just how much of a li- of a strange <laughs> license the, 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 the show yeah. and, and Mikey had to kind of go and do things. Yeah, he talked Red Bull into paying for some of that and I think Qantas picked up the airfares and TVNZ paid for some and we we flew over. There was just me and Mike and our cameraman, Mark Chamberlain, and we spent three weeks filming a half-hour show. I mean, it was just outrageous really <laughs> we had a we had a four bedroom villa with a pool up in the hills on the old side of the island above the old town and um, 
that was sort of, yeah, <laughs> that was me thinking, what am I doing in showbiz? This is mad. I remember one night my wife was at home here in New Zealand and we had our son who was about a year old, year and a half, and our daughter Molly was still in her puku. And I remember standing outside looking at the pool and the view with the villa and Mike and these girls he'd met and all these people and the booze and everything else. And I'm on the phone to Fee and she's saying, how's it going? I said, oh, it's all right, you know. <laughs> so, you know, I wish I was home with you. <laughs> and that was, um, but that was just stuff like that would happen. Not like that, but, but the show just did its own thing and I just hung on really. I, I feel looking back. Did you ever see the show WKRP in Cincinnati, the the sitcom. I'm aware of it. I didn't really. It's a, it's a classic 70s, 80s sitcom about radio. And there's a character a character in there, Andy Travis, who is the program director. And he's the sensible one who tries to hold everything together while this chaos is going around him. I'm that guy. I was that guy at BFM and I was that guy on the Havoc show. I, I tried to hold everything together and I held on and kind of made sure everything got there at the right time. Does it strike you as strange when you think back at there and then sort of flash forward to today that the sweet, generous talent that is Mikey Havoc is, you know, pretty much invisible, whereas his psychic, who's brilliant, but uh, but Jeremy Wells has now got the, you know, one of the, or two of the biggest uh, jobs in, in the country. Mm. Do, you, do you have a theory as to why it sort of played out that way? I don't know. I couldn't, I actually couldn't tell you. I mean, every person must be in control of their own destiny and Mike went that way and Jerry went that way. So from there, that, that was your sort of entry into television and then you became part of this, you know, it's Greenstone's 30th anniversary. You go into this world of sort of obs docs, factual, mm. you know, whatever, you know, reality TV, whatever you mm. want to call it. And there's this incredible run uh, Going through Neighbours at War, um, you know, into that it's still going to not not Neighbours, but but the the relationship to this day in a way. Do you want to just explain why you moved from, you know, from that sort of channel, which you could have sort of stayed in uh, forever because there were there were shows that came out of that group that that sort of I'm sure would have had you, but you you picked this new path and and created probably a at least a clear decade of some quite iconically strange but also incredibly popular uh, shows in that, that sort of broad genre. I never take the work that I get offered for granted, ever. I'm always thrilled when someone rings me and generally people who know me will tell you that if someone asks me to do something, I'll generally do it. So when, when I got the phone call from Greenstone, I wasn't, I didn't, I don't think I had a show happening right at that moment. But when Andrea Lamb phoned me and said, would you like to come and come in and have a chat about this show we've got coming up? I went in there and she said, um, would you like to do it? And I said, yeah. So I will generally take whatever is being offered to me if I think that I can. I've obviously turned stuff down in the past. Yeah. I mean, a classic example would be the, the All Blacks documentary series that they did with Amazon, was, yeah, yeah. I, turned, I turned that. Well, I sort of walked away from it quite quickly. So there's there's some stuff that that I will turn down because I know I can't do it, or I don't really have an interest. But I'll generally say yes to whatever's happening, and then see how it turns out. Well, obviously you like this well enough to to stick around for a long time. How quickly with, with Neighbours at War, which you know I, I consider if you're trying to tell the story of New Zealand television and have some kind of unruly canon that represents it, Neighbours at War should be right up there to my mind. How, how quickly did you realise that there was something quite special in this format and that it expressed a very particular kind of New Zealand aesthetic and vernacular? I want, when I started, because I'd come from the Havoc world, I wanted to... I wanted to do a good job in that genre. I wanted to be, because because making you know obstock reality television is actually quite difficult to do it well. It looks easy, but it's actually not, especially when you're doing the field direction. And I wanted it to be good. And the first season, looking back at that, is quite pedestrian. And I'm doing all the things I think I should be doing, but 
as always, se- season two, season three, I become bored and I wanted to kind of, because it was reality TV, I wanted it to parody itself and become kind of absurd. I don't really know. I mean, if you call a, want to call it something, I might have called it mockuality, but it was just, I just wanted to turn it upside down and make it New Zealand, like really New Zealand. And that, that's what it feels like. You've got these characters, and that's, I think that's what Guy Williams is trying to do with New Zealand today is just it gets harder over time as people get more sort of guarded and self-conscious and the internet changes everything. But you had this golden run. Is there like an, an – and there is like a kind of a classic grouchy – slightly strange mm. personality that, that tended to maybe rub up against a similar one or one who just wasn't going to accept it that, that generates a lot of these conflicts. Is there a particular episode that stands out from that sort of season two, three era where you're like, oh, this is really yeah. going to go? Because it became immensely popular. Like you were talking about 50% of the viewing audience at Something times. Something like that, yeah. It was, it was really popular. The third season, I think, was in, really hit its straps. But there was... I remember, and Guy Williams is obsessed with was obsessed with this one. There was a couple I'd met down in Mangere who I've told the story before, but they lived next door to a Fijian Indian family. Their cat had disappeared, and other cats in the neighbourhood had been disappearing. And because they were Fijian Indian and they were Muslim, naturally this couple suspected that they were eating the cats. Jesus Christ. I don't know how they got to that. But anyway, I went down to meet with them and had a chat to them and, and, and sort of looked at the lie of the land, if you like, and noticed a few things. And I thought, yeah, we'll probably do a story on this one. And then driving back is driving back to the office, when I, that's when I really knew that, I, that the show could be a hit because just it was so outrageous to put on air what they were thinking with and saying with straight faces. Yeah. Really, and, you- and just ordinary people. The other thing that Guy loved about that episode was Rose, Rosemary, Rosalie, Rosemary, who sent me Christmas cards for years afterwards. <laughs> she said to me she really wanted to visit her sister in Taranaki somewhere, and she also said she'd always wanted to go to Oriwa. <laughs> yeah. was like, I was like, these are the people who should be on television. You know, certainly it's great having worthy documentaries and people who've done amazing things, but why not her? Well, you're right, because it's a... It almost flipped the th- the theory of television. The kind of Rethian idea was uh, it was very kind of paternalistic in, in some ways. And New Zealand was a particularly because of the level of state control, it had a particular kind of investment in that. And that strand, you know, motorway uh, patrol, the you know renters, bogans, guts. Well, what you worked in sort of seems to quite gleefully flip that on its head and. You know, and on some level that was a thesis. Do people want this? And it turned out they, they massively did. You know, and it, looking back, it is it, it's it's a it kind of wraps together pretty well. How did you go sort of to build that out, or who were the the sort of key architects of it um, in terms of the with Greenstone and and uh, the networks? Like, because like it really did become quite a, a superstructure in a way. Tony Tony Manson, who is the commissioner at TVNZ, the wonderful Tony Manson. Um, he was probably one of my greatest champions, but everyone at Greenstone was behind it. They knew it was a hit. So everyone worked really hard on it and was you know, critical to the production of the show. All I did was go do the field direction, bring it back and cut it with, with an editor. And narrate and it. And narrate it. Which is pretty crucial because that, that, that tone, the very even tone of your narration is a big part of why it doesn't feel cruel where, where a different tone there could really change the feel. I don't it. know. I mean, I just do it. I don't. I don't. I didn't do it to do anything. I just. I just. I did the guide track, and Tony said you should do it, so I did it. When you look back on the, that sort of pantheon, you know, shows like Renters, did, was there ever a tension, or, or when you look back, do you sort of go, "Were we laughing with or at?" you know, the, the these people like, and, and wondering about how it sort of impacted their lives? Because it was quite a different, the media has become a lot more self-conscious about its impact subsequently in a way that it wasn't at that time. There's a line I'll never cross with with making television where I feel that line is, is just how I feel. But there's a line I'll never cross with people because I want them to retain their dignity. 
And over the four seasons I did of, of Neighbours at War, for example, we only really had one complaint from someone that that's I quite filmed with. Interesting. And, and she was very upset. Everyone else saw themselves on TV and said, that's it, that's great. That's, that's, that's the story. That's who I am. And I've always, um, and it probably goes right back to my radio days and my first boss, Paul Colcord, who told me how you broadcast and how you connect with the audience through the microphone. It, it doesn't matter whether it's through a page or a, a camera. It doesn't really matter. You have to be, you have to know who your people are and you have to connect with them by knowing who they are. So when you moved beyond Neighbours at War, what was the the next show that where you felt really sort of invested in it and why was that? I think all of all of them to some degree. I like doing them all. I mean, it's just, just so many. I'm just trying to think. Um, some of the more difficult ones, like the international ones, like Redwood Kings for Animal Planet, were harder to make and you feel more invested in those ones sometimes just because of the the sheer scale of them and and the the process of reduction and yeah they're, they're much more difficult to make than some of the obstocks that i have made but i'm invested in all of them every sink the one i was doing this morning you know the one i'm cutting right now at home i'm fully invested in it you know and i can't wait for my editor to watch it and see what i've done and see what he can add to it because it's just it's brilliant you know what what is it about the the sort of that observational factual space that has gripped you? Because this might, correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like the longest single mm. period of time that you've worked in a particular medium or, or with an organisation. What is it about it that kind of keeps you endlessly satisfied, I suppose? It's like a puzzle. You get the raw and you have to fashion it into something. So <clears throat> every day you're getting a block of raw footage and you have, it's up to you, you have to fashion it into something for someone else to take over and polish it up. And that's what I love. It's like being paid to do a puzzle every day. I, I st still enjoy it. We, when we spoke before, you, you mentioned having worked briefly on Married at First Sight, which is yeah. this, this blockbuster, right? <laughs> yeah. But it, you said it sort of drove you crazy. You couldn't, yeah, you couldn't, couldn't hack it, it on that one. There was the, that one in The Bachelorette, or was it The Bachelor or whatever, like at, at Warner's. And, th and, you know, of course... If, you know, thank them for asking me to do the jobs, but I just couldn't get, I didn't care, you know. I, I couldn't. Is that, why, why is that? Because they're, they're on, superficially, people might consider them similar shows, but they must be on some fundamental nature that, that, that for you they don't like. They're up. constructed reality. So those shows, you're putting people in a position and they're going to perform and you're going to create a bin with extreme close-ups of people raising their eyebrows or looking left and right, and then you're going to make what you want to make out of it. And it is what happens, but it is constructed reality, and that's different. I don't, I don't get into that. It feels like it's just not what I like to do, really. Do, do you watch it, or is it just no. no part of it? My wife does. She loves it. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> do you? Oh, okay. oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it is. It's, it's, I think it's, I mean, look, I have huge admiration for the people that make those shows because they're so hard to make. They really are. They're not easy to make. And they have to make them really quickly. And there's a lot riding on it, but it's just not my bag. You know, I, I just reeled that off that list of shows. There's not as many of them now. And the the sort of atmosphere that commissioned them and, and, and enjoyed them, the whole television environment's changed. Do you feel like the – but some of that – to, to me, like beyond the sort of technological and behavioural, there is also a licence to kind of be a bit more roguish than is, is typical now. Do you feel like, how does that change manifest? Is that in notes or is that in a, a show ending the way that Neighbours at War did? Or, or is, there, is it just the culture moves on? I don't know. Um... Like, do you feel like, as, as a sort of a practitioner, that the environment that you're operating in from a where the licence you know, the, the Overton window of it in a way. Do you think that that has changed? Yeah, it probably has. Um, but I don't, I mean, I stay out of all of that stuff. I'm just the guy that they sometimes might get to do some work on a particular show. I think, I do think sometimes there aren't enough risk takers. That's what I'm getting at, essentially. There aren't enough dangerous, unpredictable people. I'm not saying I am. But in the wider industry, I feel like they've either systematically been deleted or they've left. And in that business, 
of radio, television, whatever, if you don't have those people who may be difficult, mm. may be difficult to control, if you don't have them, your business model is um, you're in trouble. Yeah. If as an example, yeah. when I was at BFM and when I was at TVNZ, we were, there was always these problems with Mikey being late. And I would say, yeah, I know. And I can't actually drive over to his house and get him out of bed. Shall we get um, Dominic Bowden? And he will always be on time. And that was my that was my point. Dominic's a great guy, great broadcaster, but... He's not making havoc. Yeah. You have to have people with the X factor. I know exactly what it looks like. I don't have it, but I know what it looks like. And I don't, I don't think there's that much X factor rolling around as much as there used to be. I don't know. That's really interesting. So you're, the most recent project, major project you've worked on, you know, you, you were telling me about it yesterday and it, it sort of sounds almost unbelievable. Yeah, it's Billy Corgan, who you've had a lot to do with in a, from another angle, much more distant relationship yeah. um, at BFM. Just tell, tell us about the, the, this, this project, what you've been doing and, and uh, you know, how, how, and, and almost how it came about because that also speaks to how this, this sort of industry and the reality of working in it has changed. There's a guy, so there's a guy called Ben Frost who actually did work at Greenstone on renters years ago. He moved on from there. We actually worked together sort of on the food truck. I did some script editing for that and he edited it here in New Zealand. He's Australian. He went to LA and has done very well for himself. He's an executive producer at a big company called Nacelle over there in LA. And he, through some other contacts, he, ra he emailed me and said, look, probably don't remember me, but we sort of floated around each other a bit. Uh, this is what I'm doing now. We've had this show commissioned about Billy Corgan. He's bought the National Wrestling Alliance. It's not doing that well. We're going to make a show about him, his family, his band, and what he gets up to. Are you interested? And um, I was. Who wouldn't be? I said, but I do live in New Zealand. He said, don't worry, we'll do it all remote. And so... Greenstone very uh, graciously allowed me out of a contract a little bit early and I went and did that for the second half of last year. And it was um, a really different experience because I was supervising producer, which meant I had a group of um, story producers creating stuff for me, which I would work on, hand on to editors, hand back. So it was a, it was a really busy, busy um, production, but... Yeah, a great experience. And again, I just said yes. <laughs> and you just see what happens. You mentioned, again, when we spoke before, that, that you thought that the fact that you can work on a show remotely well, it was going to be a, a challenge to the local screen production industry, which previously, you know, if you were here, you are working here. Uh, do you want to just expand on that thought? I, or I, can, I can rattle off a whole list of Kiwi editors very good Kiwi editors who aren't working for anyone in New Zealand. They're doing it remotely. One of our editors on the Billy Corgan show, Lisa Greenfield, who's extremely um, gifted editor from K Road, she was working remotely, travelling around Europe, Italy. I think she was in Hungary once. And she said to me, this is normal. We we." We do stuff for internationals all the time, US dollars. Time zones are a bit different, but um, I do wonder, I, I do hope that we don't lose too many people to that because we could. You know, if you think about the UK, there are plenty of productions up there that would benefit from having someone beavering away down here while they're all asleep. Yeah, yeah, you can really see that. <laughs> Lastly, let, let's kind of, you know, because it's Greenstone's 30th birthday, uh, it'll be last Friday when this airs. What was it about that company that, that has enabled it to persist and create this, this whole basket of shows that collectively display a, a kind of rugged form of New Zealand, like a, a kind of quote-unquote real New Zealand that might have been anathema to the sensibilities when, when they started to make them, but, but that have, they, I think they've made a real contribution to kind of capturing a particular kind of person in a particular kind of era. Greenstone um, is 
my Mirai. I keep coming back to it, and I hope it stays kind of as it is. But I think some people have a little uncharitably called it the library in the past because it's quiet and nothing ever really dramatic happens there. And that may be because it's overwhelmingly populated by strong, intelligent, creative, no-nonsense women who know how to handle a production, know how to handle idiots like me, and know how to make things work. That place just always ticks along like a like a Rolls Royce. It really does. And I think that no matter what show they make there, it always gets done on time, on budget, with a minimum of fuss, and as a good product. And I reckon that's partly why. It's because of, it's of course it's because of the people that are there, but it's um that's that's probably part of it, I reckon. Well, well, uh, you know, it's 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 been so good to have you up here and to kind of explore that. What well, feels like it, it's not a, a vanished era, but certainly like it's 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 one that I think really deserves to be contemplated, uh, especially on an occasion like this. So, thank you so much for coming up, Bill. Really appreciate it. Thanks, mate. I've had a good time. <laughs>